Autistic Storytime. Let's talk about Chicago. All right, Chicago was on a whole different tip. And if you can't tell, like I stood out like a sore thumb out there, I was a piece of salt in a pepper shaker. But it was a good time. It was very unique. So how I ended up in Chicago is I was selling and slinging computers and I sold a couple to a guy out of state. You know, I was taking a risky deal with it, but it always panned out. He was trying to get these studio computers going. So these studio computers, give me one second. Mm. Coffee. So these studio computers, they were um, stocking apparently Sony and Aeroscope um, licensed, if not affiliated, um, recording studios because he was in the music business. So we get to talk him for a couple years of selling computers and just chatting it up. He's like, you got this little project on your side, so come out here, we'll get you the funding, we'll get things done. I'm like, all right. So one day I get tired and I'm just like, you know what? I don't really have much going for me except for selling computers and staying in my apartment, so why not? Plus, you know how sometimes you just get this itch to do something, to go somewhere? I had that itch to leave Arizona. So I looked at the cheapest way to ship all my stuff. I went to um, a center for freight. Who I'm not going to talk about that lawsuit. But long story short, I get over there, and when I arrive at the airport... Four hours later. Seriously, I was at the airport for four hours. Dude was saying, oh, I'm going to come, I'm going to come. I'm just like, really? Like, you knew about this a month ahead of time. I booked the flight, I shipped my stuff, and every red flag in my head is going off. But I can either retreat and eventually end up homeless, or I can see this through. Long story short, I decided to see it through. And so we end up in St. Louis, not Chicago. And once I get there, he's like, all right, so the apartment fell through. Four hours late, and then he tells me the apartment fell through. Tell me you're a shyster without telling me you're a shyster. But I still had to roll with it. I made my decision. So we lived in a um, two-bed hotel for about three weeks. And then he hits me up and says, you know what? We're going to Chicago. I'm like, okay, I totally signed up for that. But during the meantime, though, check this out. This is how I got into the music business, music industry. So Sickle Mob was going big. They had this one song where you can't understand what the heck the guy is saying. But apparently it was hitting. And so we were one of the guys trying to solicit them, trying to get them signed to a label. But they were shopping around, getting a little bit greedy, you know what I mean? So what, we ended, up hap what ended up happening was they came, went off the the um, table I brought them back see I can network my way into and out of anything and back then I mean I could ser sell a cherry popsicle to a nun in white gloves I learned that from Perfumania and I'll tell you that story later but yeah I ended up bringing them back to the table they ended up not signing because the contract was completely bogus and that's not why they didn't sign but it <laughs> I'm kind of glad they didn't. So sicko mob, S-I-C-K-O-M-O-B-B. -B. Anywho, I networked around, you know, family and all that, got them back to the table. They declined. We move on. And so this guy, he was basically robbing Peter to pay for Paul for all these different events that he was running because he legit knew, like, like he has this picture with R. Kelly where when you look at it, you're like, oh, that's R. Kelly. But when you really look at it, which he doesn't let you do. He holds it up and then pop down. When you really look at it, R. Kelly is like, that's his pose in there. And then Q is over here like, it, it's just, it's the corniest thing that, you know, shysters pull to show that they have connections. But at the same time, he really did though. I mean, he was booking Tony Braxton concerts and whatnot, you know, throwback concerts. So he was the dude you contacted. Or one of them. So he was booking one show and then using the next one to pay for the first and so on and so forth. Just floating bills left and right. And he says, hey, we're going to Chicago. So I'm like, all right, I might as well. Can't keep living out of this hotel draining my finances because my finances were hurt. So we get over there and it's his sister's apartment with her sister's, his sister's kid. 
and the baby daddy is a drug dealer. Not joking. But you know what? I got my own room, so I'm just like, you know what? Let me ride this out. It was a bad situation. Nothing was coming to fruition. He, one time he disappeared for a week, and thank God I kept my net spend card, because that's where my money was at the time. And he was about to take it with him. And I would have been stuck in that apartment for a full week without any food for the fridge or anything like that. So, I mean, he was shuffling money left and right. I mean, I saw some pretty good ways to shuffle money. But what ends up happening from there is I end up going back to church. Because the Kojic church has always been my home. Ever since I was 14, 15 years old, Kojic has always been home for me. And again, that's a church where I am the piece of salt and a pepper shake. So, I go to church looking for some kind of help to get the hell out of that apartment. Because, I mean, my freight stuff that I shipped, like my entire book collection, massive book collection, all lost. So, I mean, my heart's broken. I go to church and I start praying and I run into this dude named Hardy. He was at one of the business center convention things. And one of the other pastors introduced me to him. And Hardy does something unexpected. He listens to me. He says, come to my shop. He owned a little thrift store. And I'm just like, all right, let's do this. So I go to his shop. And he says, he hears my tail out. He's like, yeah, look at what I'm doing. You know, he's really big on selling tissue paper and all that. Man's an entrepreneur in his spirit. I had to switch hands because this hand is freezing. <laughs> so I'm using the coffee to heat it up. Mm. Copper. But yeah, he said, he hears my tale. He hears my whole story and how I got to Chicago. He's like, you know what? Let me get back to you. And so we part ways. I make my way back home. And yeah. He gives me a call the next day. And says, I want you to come back over. Got somebody I want you to meet. Like, that's not a red flag in Chicago. And this is Southside Chicago. This ain't the, you know, everybody's wearing a trench coat. No, it's everybody can't afford a trench coat. So I'm over there, you know, just... I'm like, basically, my hand is out. And it was handed out to the right person. Because he introduced, he says... I want you to meet somebody, but first, come with me. He takes me for a drive and shows me what a food desert really looks like. He shows me all the closed businesses in south side of Chicago. I'm just like, this is horrible. It's like, yeah, it's been that way for a while. And so it takes me to go meet this guy after showing me a food desert. And on the way there, I'm like, you know what? If I can do anything to fix this problem, I will. And that's a promise I'm still keeping to this day. I've got a solution to food deserts. But continuing on, he introduces me to a gentleman who owns a, like the downstairs was like a financial insurance place. The guy invested into real estate in the past and basically says, sit down over here. I'm gonna go over there and talk to him. So he walks over and talks to this guy. And I remember hearing the words, cause I got sharp hearing. I remember hearing the words, this guy's in a really bad place. So, a couple seconds later, they call me over. And I'm going to call this guy Mr. B. Because I don't want to give, you know, the full name and everything. But Mr. B calls me over and he says, All right, you can stay upstairs in the loft. It's not exactly fully furnished. But if you need a place to stay, that's a place to stay. I'm like, hey. I ain't gonna shoot a gift horse in the mouth, you know what I mean? He said, don't let me down. He asked me, how long can you, how quickly can you get money to pay for rent? I said, I don't know. I'm gonna be searching for jobs, but if you give me two months, I will own up to it. And he says, don't let me down. And everything in his tone told me a lot of people have let him down in the past. So I get to work, we get to Holland, I get to know the man. The man's actually an actor, too. Like, he actually played um, uh, Duke Ellington in a play called The Duke. It didn't air for too much, but... I mean, the guy, he's a stepper, too. I didn't even know about stepping. 
but the Chicago Step, it's one of two fully American, all-American dance styles. True story. And no, line dancing isn't one of them. If I get exposed to all these different worlds through these nice people, and I will say through the grace of church, I went back home. I found a helping hand. And so from there, I ended up, um, I found a job. I was doing side contracts here and there for IT, but I found me a job that was four hour commute one way. I stayed with that job for two months before the guy sold the business. It was a computer shop. So <laughs> that was a thing. But it also taught me a thing or two about Chicago. You know what I mean? And sorry, I had to end a call right there. Because right now you're more important. But yeah, there was one time I ended up getting stuck on the way home because I didn't catch the last bus. And the owner did call me an Uber and got me an Uber and made sure that I was able to get home. And I appreciate that. I really do. But yeah, the old guy, I mean, the one that got me into Chicago, lost track of him for good reason. And I'm going to tell you how I met the, um, the drug lord in a different video. But yes, I ran into and ran the wrong side of a small-time drug lord. Wish I was joking on that one. But such is life. But yeah, it was the grace... Is the grace of godly people. And I'll even say the grace of God that, could, that brought me out of that one. I mean, it was an adventure. Southside Chicago, I mean, I got bit by a dog. I think I still have the scar from it. I mean, I've never been sized up so much as when I walked that quarter mile to Walmart. But let me finish the story. First three days, staying at Mr. B's um, place, didn't have any heat. The gas wasn't turned on. They couldn't make it out for three days. I surrounded my bed with, because I did manage to get a mattress. It's 200 bucks. I was running the risk of bed bugs, but you know what? I need something to sleep on instead of that hard floor. And it was a loft. It was like a big, big loft. <laughs> so, and they didn't even have a um, shower in there. It had to be installed, which was done in the first two weeks. But, yeah. I had no heat, and it was negative 18 degrees outside. I put on three layers plus my coat, and I mean, I still came back, and I had frostbite on my inner thighs by the time I got home. But I got myself a space heater and a bunch of candles. Seriously, if you saw my bed that night, I basically built a cubby with the books that I did keep, because I kept my favorite books in a box instead of losing them to the freight place. And I turned him into a cubby because this actor, Mr. B, he had some costume clothing. And you know what? Some of it was pretty dang warm. So I turned it into blankets and then I used my towels as blankets. I basically created a cubby and I used a small space heater aiming into that cubby just to keep me warm that night and the next night and the next until I got heat on. But yeah, it was rough. I did get frostbite there. I did freeze my hands. I even found a patch of ice that was at least eight feet that broke my record of like 12 years of not falling. Because I don't fall. I've been practicing martial arts and balance for so long that like I spun three times before I fell, but I still ended up falling straight onto ice and concrete. But still, Mr. B helped me. And Harvey, Hardy, he helped me. I keep confusing Hardy with Harvey because Harvey, Illinois is where I met the um, small-time drug lord. But we'll go into that into a different story. But no, seriously, if you saw my, my little cubby surrounded by candles and all that just to keep warm, you'd have thought I was casting a spell. True story. Like, it, it just it looked like a seance there. But it helped me get to sleep. And Mr. B, I mean, there was a McDonald's next door. And so... I just walk over a little bit, grab some coffee, and you know, bring him an extra coffee or whatnot. I didn't have too much to my name, but I could at least spare a little kindness. It was a kind man to me. It really was. Those people helped me out when I needed it. True story.